How are you enjoying retirement? John Roberts says it's great. Or maybe the question ought to be, are you looking forward to retirement? I need to ask, I need to ask both questions because in all our congregations we have a mixture of both retired people and people who are yet to reach that milestone. It's an important question because with increasing lifespans and with better medicine, retirement has become a very different concept to the original idea. I've been told that when the retirement age was first set at 65, the average lifespan for the Australian male was something like 67. And so retirement in its original kind of concept was just this two years, the very end of life, perhaps your health wasn't very good. So it really was a, a winding down and a, a, a stopping of, of what it is that you were doing for the, the rest of your life up until that point. Um, these days we don't talk about two years, but we do talk about two decades often, don't we? when it comes to retirement. My parents moved house when they retired and the house they moved into, they lived in for 20 years before they moved again. <laughs> and my father left home when he was 16 years of age and so the house he moved into when he retired, that's the house he's lived in for the longest continual period in his entire life and he's now 86 years of age. Uh, retirement is not really the end, it's more like a change these days. I remember when my dad retired, he took me with him uh, to, to buy himself a new car. I remember him telling me, this is the last car I'm ever going to own. <laughs> and so he splashed some cash. He bought a six-cylinder rather than a four-cylinder. Uh, but it wasn't the last car he owned. He's bought a new one just a couple of years ago. He had to because the old one was, um, was almost 20 years of age. At retirement these days is more like a change in activity rather than a stopping of activity uh, and for a good period of time too uh, that seems to be what retirement is about I think there are plenty of people who either think or they wish that when Jesus was hung up upon that cross that's when Jesus retired in the old-fashioned sense that's when he stopped he had an interesting career as a teacher he had uh, obviously a, a, a big effect through his death it was a very noble thing to, to do but really, that's it. There's no more action from Jesus after that point. And people might ask the question, why are we listening to stories that are 2,000 years old? Jesus is a man of the past. The world has moved on. So should the church. The church should move on from this figure, Jesus Christ. Let's put him to bed. Let's put him out the pasture. Let's think about other things. Well, Easter Day is an annual reminder that Jesus did not retire 2,000 years ago. That death was not the end. That he was raised from the dead, that he's still alive, that he's still active, that he's still involved in this world. That's what Easter Day reminds us of. And this seems to be the fact, the fact of Jesus' resurrection, this seems to be the fact that most animated and excited the early Christians, this is the thing that really got them going. Uh, this series that we've been looking at over the last number of weeks is looking at the activity of the early church, the earliest Christians. We've been asking the question, what can we learn as we look at the earliest church? And everything that we've looked at, the thing that underpinned all of it was the fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And in fact, the, mo the key activity that we see the early church involved in is one that we've left here right to the end. They spoke up about how Jesus was no longer dead. They spoke up about how Jesus had been raised from the grave. Now, that was the big key defining action of the early church, speaking about the resurrected Jesus. The reason it was the topic they always circled back to is because many of them had seen the resurrected Jesus. Uh, take this comment. I'm just going to go back to another presentation here. Uh, take this comment from Peter in the middle of today's Bible reading. Acts chapter 2, verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. When you notice something remarkable... You want to talk about it, don't you? Uh, we've all sat through um, 
discussions with family members, excited family members when they've come back from an overseas trip. They've seen some remarkable things and they want to tell us about it. And sometimes those conversations can go on, can't they? Uh, but if we were there with them, we'd probably want to speak about it too, to be honest. Uh, seen, seen some amazing things overseas and so we want to tell people about it. And so it is with these earliest Christians. They had seen the resurrected Jesus and so they couldn't stop speaking about it. This is uh, Peter and John in Acts chapter 4. As for us, they say, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. That Jesus has been raised from the dead and that he's active and that he's doing things. We, we can't keep our mouth shut. We need to speak about it. Now, many people have expressed doubts as to whether these apostles really did witness what they say they witnessed. Uh, what if they made it up? What if they saw an opportunity to create their own religion, to create their own movement? Um, wouldn't it be a good selling point to make a claim about a leader who defeated death? Why don't we make this Jesus character as someone who's been raised from the dead? We'll tell people that, and then they're likely to follow our religion uh, was it just a lie in order to create something? Well, if they are lying, then they're willing to go through some pretty serious hardships, aren't they, in order to maintain this fabrication. Beatings at the hands of religious officials, threats of execution, execution itself. Uh, it's pretty remarkable for them to maintain this lie in the face of all that hardship be very tempting for them to drop the lie and just not have to suffer uh, all those things. What if they were willing to lie if it meant leaving a legacy? What if they were willing to suffer if it meant leaving a legacy? Because as they first, first talk, spoke about Jesus, thousands of people came to believe and that had to be pretty exciting. What if they thought to themselves, well, no, let's lie and it's worth the risk if we're going to get all this success and we're going to get all these followers um, it may, maybe it's worth uh, putting ourselves out there for that. Well, as time went on, the legacy looked more and more fragile. Those thousands of early converts in Jerusalem, as soon as persecution happened, they were scattered all throughout the Mediterranean world. And by the end of the book of Acts, the crowds are more likely to stone the Christians rather than believe them. And so if they're looking to lie and, and suffer in order to gain some kind of legacy, um, then it seems as if they were still willing to lie, even though that legacy was looking more and more fragile. And when the successes were, were drying up, still they insisted that Jesus had been raised from the dead. So I'm not quite sure they were doing it in order to find success. Maybe they didn't think they were lying. Maybe they sincerely believed the resurrection, but it's just that they were deluded. They'd made a mistake. They got it wrong. I, maybe it's conceivable that one person might have seen Jesus in a hallucination. But for many, many people to have the same hallucination in exactly the same way, I think that's kind of doubtful. I'm not quite sure they were deluded in that sense. Uh, perhaps this idea of Jesus started with one lie or one hallucination, uh, but many people believed because they just convinced one another. They kind of got caught in a bit of an echo chamber. Uh, maybe it's an example of what some people call groupthink. An idea gets born and then it just gets reinforced by one another. It's how cults work. Uh, usually there's some kind of cult leader who suggests to everyone else that he is some kind of God and one or two people believe it, but the group becomes isolated and so this belief kind of festers. We kind of see it with social media, don't we? We talk about social media bubbles. People in an echo chamber, they just reinforce the same ideas. Maybe that's what's happening with these early Christians. Well, that kind of group think requires the group to stay together. It requires them to kind of be mutually reinforcing this idea. It requires a bit of a chamber, an echo chamber. But that's not what happened with these early Christians because they were scattered all throughout the Mediterranean world. Sometimes because of persecution, other times because... They decided to go out on their own and to plant churches in different parts of the world. They didn't have that mutual reinforcement all the time. And so if this was just some kind of group delusion, pretty soon they were exposing themselves to other thoughts and other ideas, but yet the idea of the resurrection persisted. I think perhaps the best explanation 
is that the disciples were telling the undefiled truth. That they were, in fact, witnesses to the resurrection of a man who had been crucified. That it was true. And so they couldn't help talking about it. They just had to keep on speaking. But the resurrection was not just something exciting and not just something amazing, but it was also something that had very big implications, particularly how we understand the role of Jesus. Um, He hadn't retired, to use the image from earlier, but he just shifted his work. And the resurrection saw three shifts in the way we understand Jesus and the way that the early Christians understood Jesus. First of all, the resurrection made Jesus into a multinational missionary. Jesus was a missionary before. He was on mission with his own, within his own local area, a region about 120 kilometres long from Galilee down to Jerusalem and then maybe about 60 or 80 kilometres wide from the coast over towards the area just on the other side of the Jordan River. Jesus was a local preacher and he was preaching to, on the whole, one cultural group, the Jewish people of that part of the world. But the resurrection saw the mission of Jesus take on a massive increase in scope. All of a sudden, it became a much bigger thing that he was on about. In Acts 26, verse 23, Paul is on trial before the Roman governor Festus. And so here it is, the message of Jesus kind of expanding beyond the the realms of the local Jewish people. Paul is speaking to the Roman governor. And he says this, I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Gentiles is just a word meaning all those who are not Jews, (laughs) the rest of the world. So Jesus continues as a missionary, bringing a message of light to people, but the scope is now all of a sudden now much, much bigger. It's a scope that includes all of us, no matter what our cultural background, no matter what our age, no matter where it is we see ourselves in life. Perhaps we might see ourselves as being successful, perhaps we not, have not achieved the success that we might want to have achieved. No matter where we find ourselves, Jesus has an interest in us. We fall within his purview. We we, we fall under his scope. He's interested in us. He has a word for us. Are we open to receive what it is he has to offer us? It's not just an individual for a particular group of people at a particular place in time, but his scope now includes the whole world, and that includes us. So if Jesus is still preaching, if he's still carrying on this mission, how is it that we can hear him? We learned in the beginning of Acts that after Jesus was raised from the dead, he appeared to his disciples and then he was taken up into heaven. If he's been taken up into heaven, how can he bring a message to the world when he's no longer here? Well, a clue from our Bible reading earlier on. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Exalted to the right hand of God, Peter says... Jesus has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. And what is it that Jesus, Peter's listeners, saw and what is it that they heard? Well, the occasion here was Pentecost when the newly arrived Holy Spirit enabled the disciples to declare the wonders of God all in different languages as Jesus spoke through the Holy Spirit And people from all around the world were able to hear his message in their own language. Jesus carries out this expanded missionary work through his spirit-empowered disciples. Peter explains this method further in chapter 10, starting at verse 39. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses who God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Sometimes people ask, well, if Jesus has been raised from the dead, how come he just doesn't show himself now. Surely that would be a really effective way to get people to believe in him, 
Just make a new tour every 10 years or so. Just like what you too do. They go on tour every 10 years to remind us that they haven't died. And so maybe this is what Jesus needs to do. He needs to appear again. Well, part of the answer comes in these verses when Peter admits that Jesus didn't appear to everyone, but he appeared to some whom he appointed to go and preach. Jesus' method of reaching people was not by physically parading himself around to each and every generation, but rather to use the spirit-empowered speaking of his message by his messengers to each generation. That's how Jesus makes himself known. Why he chooses this method, I think it's got to do with his grace and generosity. He wants to recruit us into what it is that he is doing in the world, to give us a part to play, not just to take the burden on himself, but to say, you know what, I'm inviting you all in to be a part of this great mission that I'm continuing in the world in which we live. Perhaps I guess you could think of this shift in Jesus' work. It's a bit like a regional manager getting the promotion and becoming the global manager of a particular brand or product. I mean, all of a sudden, there's a lot more people who are going to be exposed to that product and a lot more people need to be recruited into the activity, uh, the activity of promoting what it is that the master wants to promote. Are you willing to be a recruit? How is it that Jesus will lead you to speak about the forgiveness of sins over the next few months? Because he's at work and he recruits us to be a part of it. And within this passage from Acts 10, we see another shift in Christ's work. His resurrection means that he's been appointed as judge of the living and the dead. John 3.17 tells us that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Before his death, Jesus' ministry was not about judgment. It was about salvation. But now that he's died and he's been raised from the dead, he's got his judge's gown on. And he's waiting for that day where he is going to come and judge the world, where he's going to sort the righteous from the unrighteous, where he's going to punish evil and he's going to accept those who've accepted his offer of the forgiveness of sins. That day is coming. Um, Paul, in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, informed the people of Athens that God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Um, you know, sometimes the Bible uses the image of fire to help us comprehend God's judgment. During last year's Black Summer, it's a frightening term, isn't it? I mean, we, we've had Black Saturdays before, but last year was a Black Summer. Um, during those fires, I read a, a newspaper article about the Indigenous method of fire management, about how the Indigenous people of Australia cleared the land uh, using fire. And the method they used was, was a slow, cool burn. It's an interesting phrase, a cool burn. A cool burn is a less intense fire that gets rid of all the weeds, gets rid of all the undergrowth, but it allows all the animals to find time to, to escape, to run up into the canopy, to hide deep under the ground. A less intense fire enables that kind of clearing to take place. At fire management, the indigenous way has two aims, get rid of the bad while trying to save as much as possible. And it seems to me to be a useful analogy to speak about these two roles that the resurrected Jesus has. He is on a mission to save, but he will send a fire through at some point because he is the judge. The illustration falls down a little with this idea of a cool burn which allows animals to hide from the flames because when Jesus sends the fire through, there's going to be no opportunity to hide. The time for salvation is now. Now is the time to accept the forgiveness of sins that Jesus offers. Because there won't be any time when the judge returns. But we do see within Jesus this double nature of the, him being the resurrected Lord. He is a judge, but he also brings a message of forgiveness. That's a message we need to hear. Fires also have another aspect, don't they, in that they 
rejuvenate the bush, bringing new life. In fact, there are some plants which cannot germinate unless a fire goes through. Here's a picture of pink flannel flowers, which all of a sudden over the last year have emerged in the Blue Mountains. Those areas that were scarred by fire have allowed these seeds, which remain dormant in the ground for decades and decades and decades, it's allowed these seeds to suddenly germinate. And there are whole fields of pink flowers at the bottom of black trees. <laughs> Sometimes a fire is needed to bring new life. And it's kind of similar to how it is we understand the judgment that Jesus will bring. Because after he brings judgment, there will be new life. There will be resurrection from the dead. There will be eternal life. And Jesus, as the one who's been raised from the dead, he is the one who is the pioneer into that second way of being human. As we said in the Nicene Creed, Jesus became truly human. We see that in the, his ministry before he died. But when he was raised from the dead, he was raised as the first one, as the new renewed humanity, the first member of that new human race, which we will all join at some point, those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus. Um, it's been the Bible's testimony since the Old Testament that God's people can always look forward to a renewed life after the grave. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, we're told in Daniel 12, verse 2. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting destruction. This was the hope of Israel, that one day God's people will be raised from the grave and they would live forever with their God. And the resurrection of Jesus is simply the first instance of this hope now being realised. It's proof that the hope of resurrection was not just a nice idea, not just a maybe, but it was a definitely. This is going to happen. We will rise again from the grave. We know it's a certainty because we've seen it happen with Jesus. And what happens to Jesus will happen with us because we are unified with him. We believe in him. We are unified with him. And he pulls us through to have the same experience that he experienced on that first Easter day. That day is coming for us. When Jesus returns, um, even though many of the Jews believed in this idea of resurrection, they didn't like hearing that it was Jesus who was bringing it about because they didn't like Jesus. So those who were speaking this idea about the resurrection in Jesus' name, they were put on trial because people didn't like hearing about it. Here's words from Paul when he is on trial before King Agrippa. He says in Acts 26, And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Is there prophesied in the Bible? It's been proved to us by the resurrection of Jesus. There is a future for us. Sometimes it's hard to feel hopeful in the face of death, isn't it? You know, in my job, I come face to face with death more often than I would like. As I minister to people who are dying, as I'm discussing with them what's going to happen after they die, as we talk about funerals, everything just seems so final when you're in those conversations. You know, there's final conversations, there are final arrangements to be made. It can all seem rather hopeless. But Jesus has pioneered a way through it. It's like we've come to the end of the road, we've come to a cul-de-sac, but Jesus says, hang on, here's a path. A path going from the end of the road through to a, a wonderful field which opens up, which is just a wonderful place to be. Kind of like when you drive to the beach and you park your car in the car park and you're looking around saying, well, where's the beach? And you can hear the, the waves and then you see a path. And so you go down the path and then it opens up this wonderful vista I mean, this is what's waiting for us when it comes, it comes time to, to finish this life and move on to the next. There is a path that Jesus has found. And he's gone down it, first of all, and he says to us, come and follow me. <laughs> there is something wonderful at the end of this path. He's been there. He knows it. So he invites us to follow him. He's the pioneer. The pioneer of life after death. Speaking of ends, uh, this is the end of our Acts series. I want to remind you of how Luke begins this book. 
with these words. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Interesting use of word, isn't it? Began. What does that imply? It implies that he hadn't stopped. Luke was talking about what was begun and then his former book ends with Jesus' death, but it was still only a beginning. The book of Acts is all about what the resurrected Jesus was doing in the early church. It's a reflection of what he continues to do among us today. Uh, just a beginning is what we read in the Bible. Um, he didn't stop. He's not retired. He continues to work. Are you allowing yourself to benefit from it? To receive that forgiveness of sins, are you participating in it? Uh, to go along with Jesus as he continues in this great mission. I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Easter Day where you raised Jesus from the dead. It has big implications for us, but uh, we've been thinking about the implications for Jesus this morning. That he now has a, a worldwide task that he's enacting. That he's recruiting us to be a part of that that we come under that worldwide task. And so the message is for each one of us. Will we receive the forgiveness of sins? And it means that he'll come one day to judge, and so we want to receive that forgiveness of sins ahead of time so that we will survive that day of ju judgment and that we will enjoy the eternal life that Jesus has pioneered, that he is the, the life that he has gone before us in, in, in order to explore and to confirm for us. And so we want to to say, yes, we want that eternal life. We thank you that it can be ours through the work of Jesus and only through the work of Jesus in whom we put our trust. In his name we pray. Amen.